Good morning. This is Richie Butler, Senior Pastor of St. Paul United Methodist Church. I want to welcome you to our our weekly prayer call for racial healing and reconciliation. And if you will, uh, for a point of of logistics, if you don't mind muting your phone so that we don't uh, pick up background noise, we would greatly appreciate it. And we will start momentarily. Again, welcome to our prayer call for racial healing and reconciliation. Uh, I am uh, Pastor Richie Butler of St. Paul United Methodist Church. On behalf of my co-conveners, the Reverend Kathy Sweeney and the Reverend Dr. Andy Stoker, we thank you for joining us on this uh, Friday as we, uh, before Christmas as we, those of us in the Christian faith, prepare to celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I was at an event a few few days ago, and the question was asked, what do you want for for Christmas? And most of the people, um, probably 95% of the people who responded to the question were clear about uh, what they wanted personally. And only a handful of people, you know, responded with uh, notions of, Peace and you know things that that were not of self quote unquote self interest um, and I thought about that question, what do you want for Christmas and I think we actually need to uh ask the question of God see if if God can illuminate that question uh his response to us, in other words, what does God want for Christmas? And if we ask that question, it forces us to go to his word and to spend some time with him and reflection on what it is he wants, not necessarily what what we want. So with that, let's pray. We thank you, Father, for this day, for this opportunity to spend a moment seeking healing and reconciliation uh, in this uh, challenge, uh, this historically harmful area in the life of our society called racism. Lord, we know that in and all things are possible in you and through you. And so, God, we want to ask the question, what do you want? And what do we do in response to your desire? So speak to our hearts. And then, Lord, give us the will, the commitment, the passion, the fervor, and the work ethic to bring to bring your kingdom uh, to make your kingdom a reality here on earth in your name the name of Jesus we pray amen I believe that uh, God is doing and continues to do a great work in us and through us when we ask the question what does God want and in recognizing that God continues, and I believe is in, is doing a great work in us and and through us, it also is reflective of the moment in which we we live. That I think there is necessitates us doing a great work uh, because you consider the the crisis of our of our moment, uh, the uncertainty uh, when we. Th- Think about from an economic standpoint, uh, the stock market is at its lowest point, uh, has had the, the greatest decline in the month of December since 1931, Great Depression times. Um, we think about the, the unrest in our, in our government, uh, the uncertainty, 
uh, more cabinet and administrative uh, officials have resigned in the two years of Trump's administration uh, versus between Bush, Obama, and Clinton. Um, so more have resigned in two years than uh, the first two years between the combined of those those three presidents. I mean, we really are, and 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 I believe what's going on in Washington and and the the divisiveness and all the challenges is a mirror reflection of where we are as a nation. So we, I believe, are in a a moment of crisis because we are a nation, a moment of transition. We're a nation. It is a moment of transition. Three things just for us to consider as we think about this nation uh, being in transition. One, we have a demographic transition, a shift. Uh, We are becoming, and I think now, most people have awakened to the fact that this country is browning. Um, and I think that is, uh, for some, that is unnerving, and it's, it's frightening and scary. But that's a, that's a reality. We are browning. That, the demographic shift transition. We also are a nation that is not just facing a demographic shift to transition, but we're also facing what I, what I classify as a generational shift in transition. We literally have... Uh, two barbells of this nation. We have the baby boomers who, who are retiring, and they are rolling off the scene. And then we have the Gen Xers who are in the middle and a smaller population. And then we have uh, the millennials who will be the largest generation of its of its time uh, in the nation's in this nation's history. And 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 that represents cultural class. Uh, challenges, you know, and with the advent and the increased impact and role of technology in our society, social media, all these things, it, there's a confluence that is playing itself self out. And then I'd say the the last uh, piece that puts us, I believe, in this crisis of, of the moment is with the with the baby boomers rolling off the scenes. There is what I'd classify as an economic or wealth transition. Uh, the baby boomers represent the wealthiest, the greatest amount of wealth in this nation's history uh, fall within the baby boomers. And so as they roll off the scene, uh, there, is, there is a transition, a need for where, where that, those, those dollars are distributed or redistributed. Um, and, and so the confluence of these matters plus just the, the mere fact of the history of, of racism and, 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 and how it's reared its ugly head and continues to permeate in our society and a host of other, you know, and I'm not even talking about just personal matters that we as individuals have to deal with. Um, we, I believe, are, have a crisis of moment because we are in transition. And transitions are not easy. But I also believe that God desires to do a great work in us and through us in this moment of of transition. And I would like to to liken our moment of transition, uh, this moment of transition, and the great work that God desires to do in us and through us to Joseph, who um, was married, was uh, engaged to be married to Mary. And if you recall, the angel showed up and told Mary that she would give birth to, a, to, to Jesus, who would be the Messiah, the Savior of the world. And Joseph got wind that his fiance was, in, was pregnant with child, and he knew he was not the father. Now, if you want to talk about a personal crisis, if you think about that, you are engaged to someone. You've never had uh, sex with them. They're pregnant. <laughs> You're talking about crisis. You're talking about drama. You're 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 you're, you're talking about messiness, um, and and Joseph, being the honorable man he he was, he was prepared to to divorce her quietly, so it would not be a public uh, melee and 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 cause a lot of rift. But I want you to also note that that something happened in the life of of Joseph. One, he was able to position himself. To listen to God. Because in that text, in Matthew, the first chapter, verse 18 through 25, Joseph, the text says he falls asleep. 
Now, his, in, when you think about the historical context of him falling asleep because he was, he, he, the angels showed up in a dream, rather. The angels showed up and spoke to him in a dream. Dreams uh, in, in the historical context were significant because uh, that was an opportunity for people to hear from God. And so they had to be in a place. And typically, um, they would go to, to a holy place, uh, um, you know, the temple, a place where, where they could sleep. And in other words, they would find themselves in a location, in a posture position, so they could hear from God. And so I want to say to us, because Joseph was prepared to divorce her, but what Joseph didn't realize is that he was written into this historical narrative. Um, he was supposed to be a part of this. And if he had relied on the law, if he had relied on 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 Family members and probably friends who told him, "Man, why are you with? Why are you gonna stay with this woman? She, she, she's pregnant, and you're not the daddy." Uh, but Joseph, Joseph listened to God, and I want to say to us, in the this crisis of the moment, we must listen to God. It is difficult to discern the voice of God and what God is saying, and. Further, because we have these competing noises vying for our attention, not voices, but noises in our world vying for our attention, sometimes it becomes challenging. But I want to encourage us to, like Joseph, get to a place so we can hear, so we can receive what God wants to say to us individually in, in respect to what's going on on a macro level. Uh, Joseph got away from the noise so that he could hear. Because when he woke up, the Bible says that he, well, in his dream he heard what was, what was really going on and the angel spoke to him and he understood what God was doing in this moment, in this moment of crisis where he was going to cast Mary aside. So we must, we must, we must, we must listen to God and also know how he speaks. He doesn't always yell. He may come to us in a dream. He may come to us through a sermon. He may come to us through nature. He may come to us through crisis. He may come through us to, for, through friends. But God is speaking, and we must listen. And the good news in the story that Joseph heard because he was listening to God, but also he trusted in God. Because after he woke up, the Bible says that he obeyed the angel's command. In other words... As crazy as it sounded, she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit. That's a miracle. Pregnant by the Holy Spirit. It's hard to explain that to your mama, your daddy, to your friends. Uh, the law, that there's, there's anything in the, in the, in the rabbinical law that, that speaks to being pregnant you know, by, by, by the Holy Spirit. But he trusted in God, and he woke up, and he obeyed and followed God's instructions. And so... I want, and what that really means is that Joseph allowed everything else in his life to become subordinate to him trusting in God. That means his ego had to be in a subordinate position. His pride had to be in a subordinate position. His image had to be in a subordinate position. The law that he was that he was upholding had to be in a subordinate position. And there are so many areas in our lives that we must subordinate so that we can obey and trust God. And so I want to challenge us on this day to listen to God, to trust in God as we encounter the headwinds, as we encounter the turbulence, as, as we encounter the challenges, as we are faced as facing transition or everything that we're going through. The good news, God created us. And God is sustaining us, and God will keep us. But if, but we must listen to him, and we must trust in him. And in doing so, he will bring us out, and we will realize his kingdom come, his will be done on this earth as it already is in heaven. Let us pray. We thank you. We thank you that Joseph teaches us to listen to you and to trust in you. And a miracle, God, we, we need a miracle. We need a racial Pentecost. We need a miracle. 
We need a miracle in Washington, God. We, we need a miracle in our own homes, God. We, we need a miracle in the church. Talk about division. But, Lord, if we listen to you, trust in you, it may look foolish, the Holy Spirit impregnating, the Holy Spirit doing something that hasn't been done before. But, God, you prove yourself, and I believe you want to do that again in us and through us, a great work. So we claim that for our own lives, for the life of our churches, for the life of our community, for the life of our nation. So we trust you, and we're going to listen to you. And it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I want to thank you for joining us today for our our prayer call every Friday, 9 a.m. We come together. Uh, because we believe that if racism is a cancer in our society, this is our chemotherapy session to rid us of that cancer. Take care. Be blessed. Have a wonderful, blessed, uh, transformational, remarkable Christmas. We'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.